So I have the great pleasure today to uh, uh, welcome uh, to our webinar um, Mr. Michael Eisenstadt, uh, a Khan Fellow and Director, Military and Security Studies Program of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Now he is going to speak to us. Uh, he's going to give us a lecture uh, on operating in the gray zone, Iran's asymmetric way of war. That's the title. Uh, I'm going to request him to speak for about uh, uh, what has been put down as roughly 25 minutes. And then we have uh, three very, very interesting and eminent uh, panelists, uh, what we call discussants as well. Um, the first of which is Dr. Michael Connell, uh, director of the Iranian Studies Program at the Center for Naval Analysis. And I welcome him uh, to our webinar as well. Uh, then we have uh, our close neighbor and good friend here, uh, at the USI, Major General B.K. Sharma, who is the current director of the USI. Uh, he, I assume, in normal circumstances, would only have had to use a ladder or jump the wall to get to us. And we, likewise, if you wanted to go there, uh, that's how close we are. Um, then we have our own very own uh, expert from the Institute, uh, Commodore Abhay Kumar, research fellow uh, at the IDSA. Uh, they'll be the discussants. Now, a few words on the topic itself. The topic, of course, gray zone, tactics, Iran, and straight away, uh, obviously, what comes to mind is what Iran has masterfully practiced, according to some, for a considerable period of time. And this is the topic on which the experts will obviously uh, tell you more. Uh, we have seen how Iran has uh, uh, used uh, to its advantage uh, the tactic of uh, using foreign legions or using proxies, uh, using asymmetric uh, methods of warfare, um, the type which enables Iran to uh, really remain just below the radar of an all-out war, uh, something that enables Iran to uh, achieve its uh, objectives, expand its influence, but not necessarily upset the apple cart such that uh, the adversaries or uh, combatants are forced to uh, escalate in a particular direction that may not be uh, of advantage to Iran. We have seen how uh, Iran has quite successfully, uh, according to experts, and, and, and I'm not really an expert on the subject, but according to experts, how they have actually used this to, tactic to their advantage uh, with the Hezbollah uh, in terms of uh, getting the Americans out of Lebanon in 1984, uh, getting the Israelis out of Lebanon in uh, 2000. And subsequently, we have seen the same kind of tactic of using proxies, etc., uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, getting uh, the Americans again uh, to vacate uh, Iraq uh, around 2011. We have seen how they have successfully used the Shia in Syria to their advantage, um, uh, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, and also the asymmetrical aspects uh, of uh, combining uh, conventional and non-conventional methods of warfare, uh, making the best use of uh, what one might call hybrid uh, warfare. Uh, that includes, of course, the entire spectrum, including cyber uh, warfare as well. So military and non-military tactics uh, have been rather successfully used. Uh, its location, of course, uh, also gives it a certain uh, locational advantage, sitting uh, at the mouth of the you know, Strait of Hormuz. Uh, and um, what it does, therefore, uh, conventionally or unconventionally, is of immense significance to not just the resident littoral uh, states that uh, exist in the Indian Ocean, but also the uh, extra, so-called extra regional powers who also have a long-standing presence uh, and interest in the region. That, of course, primarily uh, includes uh, in that list the United States of America. With these few words, uh, and not to stand between you and our eminent speakers and, and the lineup today, uh, I will now request uh, uh, Mr. Michael Eisenstadt to take the floor. You have uh, roughly 25 minutes of your own and five minutes of mine that I'm ceding to you uh, since we are still at 4.35. Uh, so you actually have 30 minutes, and the floor is yours. Please unmute your mic, 
Yes, yes. And, and begin now. Yes, please. The floor is yours. Please unmute. Please unmute. That's it. You've done it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank Let's you roll. very much. Thank you. Challenged, challenged by technology, which is also a blessing. So anyhow, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Chinoy, for the introduction. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Mina Singh Roy for um, extending this invitation. Um, very grateful for the opportunity to appear with um, these excellent panelists, and I'm looking forward um, simply to kick off a conversation with uh, our Indian colleagues um, about this whole concept of the gray zone. And I, um, I think the reason why I'm very happy to do this, I think it's very important that uh, thinkers and analysts uh, among the democracies uh, exchange ideas and thoughts about how we deal with the in very often common challenges we face. I understand uh, Iran might be seen differently than uh, by, by some of our friends in India than by many Americans, but the point is I, I simply want to kick off a discussion about ways of war and um, as uh, defense analysts about how um, the military instrument is best used in the current um, conditions that we find ourselves in the world today. The reason why I wrote this monograph, which is the basis of my presentation today, is because I felt that, first of all, the United States, I think, is often trapped in ways of doing things which are rooted in our past experience, which is often the case with um, militaries everywhere. Um, and it has our, our conventional warfare paradigm and our both mental models and the vocabulary we use is is inappropriate to the challenges that we're currently facing face in the world. And as a result, we often act inappropriately um, and, and in a way that is um, does not always serve our interests best. I also wrote it because I feel that sometimes it's um, important to be able to learn from your adversaries. And I've been studying Iran for about 30 years now. Um, I find it an endless source of uh, fascination and um, there's always new facets um, for me to learn. And um, I've, I wrote a piece about a decade ago about Iran's strategic culture. But I felt I kind of uh, arrived at a dead end in my understanding of how Iran operates, unless I bring to bear um, new ways of looking at the problem. So for many years, I've followed the debate in the military literature about gray zone conflicts, hybrid warfare, asymmetric warfare, and while I think many of these, many of the articles that I've read in the past um, were, you know, the concepts were well-defined, they were often poorly operationalized. And very often, many writers use the terms interchangeably. They use gray zone conflict, hybrid warfare, asymmetric warfare interchangeably. So when I, I decided, you know, maybe I need to revisit my approach. I, I, again, I, I've stayed away from these, what I considered buzzwords until now, because I felt a lot of the work was not well operationalized. But when I started looking at the literature, I felt that it actually could provide some value added and help me get to the next level in terms of my own analysis, as long as I define the, pro uh, the terms right correctly and understand how they relate to each other. And also, which is something that I did a little, and I'll, I'll talk about it here in a few minutes, kind of integrate them into our traditional um, strategy model of ways, means, and ends, okay? So I'll talk, a, and actually in the end, I've, be, I've, I've become a, a, convert, a convert. I believe that actually, although these buzzwords sometimes do not provide a lot of clarity because they're used imprecisely, if you define them right and put them in correct relationship to each other, I think they're very powerful. So I would, and, and I think it could, enable us in the United States to deal more appropriately and think um, um, in a different way about the challenges we face today, in part learning from our adversaries and devising our own gray zone approach, um, which I believe enables us to accomplish a number of objectives. The most important thing being that the way we have tended to act, for instance, the way we responded 
to um, the death of an American uh, contractor in Iraq in December, um, with you know, killing uh, members of first Qatar Hezbollah and then Qasem Soleimani and Abu uh, Abu Mahdi al Mohandis, um, created a lot of problems domestically for the administration as well as in Iraq. And I felt that actually a different way of acting in accordance with its gray zone approach would be more compatible with our policy objectives and with the domestic as well as regional operational environment. So it's, I think it's a better way of doing business. First of all, if the US goal is to forge a new deal with Iran on a range of issues to create a new uh, deal in order to replace the JCPOA, then I think a gray zone approach, one which relies on covert or deniable action, um, uh, incremental um, uh, action rather than dramatic um, overt activities and discrete messaging is more consistent with this goal because overt, um, es potentially escalatory action um, that we, um, and it, that is accompanied with kind of demonstrative public statements, I think is, 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 is problematic from the point of view of trying to reestablish a diplomatic um, process. So acting quietly um, um, below the radar screen, so to speak, is a more effective way of you know, in, acting to advance our interests, but in a way that does not undermine the potential for renewed diplomacy with Iran. Secondly, as I mentioned before, Given the domestic mood here, the, polit uh, the, the polarization of American politics, um, the widespread desire to avoid another Middle Eastern forever war, acting discreetly under the radar screen, using covert um, or deniable or unacknowledged activities is, is, a, is a more effective way and a more sustainable way of acting, which is consistent with the domestic mood. Likewise, in terms of the regional operational environment, we saw what happened in Iraq after the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al mohandis that the whole U.S. presence became a political issue. Of course, nothing came of it, but who needs to create these kind of headaches for yourself? If you act quietly, discreetly, in a deniable way, your actions are less likely to roil um, this, this situation in Iraq, where we might have to act. Um, it's also, I would argue, acting in this way is more consistent with the prerequisites of success in a protracted conflict that we find ourselves in with Iran right now, okay? These kinds of conflicts are won on points, not on knockout blows. So stop trying to, stop trying to hit home runs as you have know, to put it in American sports vernacular. Try to, you know, hit singles, hit, you know, seek small gains over a long period of time. Plus I would argue that this kind of quiet approach is a more consistent with a, you know, is more likely to get bipartisan support and be sustainable over the long run, whether or not Mr. Trump is reelected president or, or Mr. Biden is elected president, okay? Also, such an approach is more consistent with our current national defense strategy, which requires us to eventually shift our focus and our forces to the Indo-Pacific region. We're going to have to make do with less in the Middle East, and I would argue a gray zone approach does not require a very robust force structure. It requires more consistent action, but with smaller forces, very focused kind of activities. So you don't need a large, you don't need one or two carrier strike groups in the Persian Gulf region in order to uh, carry out this policy. And then finally, I would argue that the future is gray, okay? By and large, um, the future of warfare, I, I, don't, I don't say that conventional major conflicts are not going to happen. Of course, that will always be a feature of, unfortunately, of the human condition. But I think conflicts in the future, we've already seen this with the Russians and the Chinese, you know, will be increasingly gray and involve what, you know, uh, we refer to as gray zone activities, okay? So we need to develop an, uh, competencies in this area and Iran's a good place to start. So let me just, I'm going to go very quickly here and just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the whole idea of gray zone conflict and the, and the like, but the bottom line is I'll just summarize very quickly for those who are maybe less familiar. Gray zone activities, like I said before, involve, um, and, or they enable anti-status quo actors to advance their interests while managing risk, preventing escalation and avoiding war. 
They do this by constantly testing and probing to see what they can get away with. They use ambiguity, incrementalism, and activities below the threshold of war, which of course is a problematic concept because you don't always know exactly where that threshold is, but that's why you test and probe, okay? They often use proxies, covert or unacknowledged activities, cyber operations to avoid becoming decisively engaged. This is critical and we could discuss that a little bit more in a moment. And, they, and this whole mode of operation creates uncertainties among enemies about how to respond. Now, let me just say, I think this approach is rooted in universal aspects of human psychology. And I'll give you an example. My brother, when I was growing up, was the master of the gray zone, okay? So I'd be sitting at my desk doing homework as a teenager, and he would come to the, just the, the entrance to my room, and he would start whistling to try to annoy me, okay? You know, <laughs> I know you can't focus on your homework because I'm annoying you, and he would keep doing that. And I would just ignore him. And then he would take little pieces of paper and he'd start throwing it at me, okay, at my desk. And I would just try to ignore that. He would then step into my room, one step and one step out, and then two steps in and two steps out, and then three steps in. And finally, I'd start running after him and he would start screaming, mom, dad, Mike's chasing me. So he's trying to get the great powers to intervene on his behalf, okay? And then he'd run to his room, the door would be slightly open and he would slam the door shut and lock it. So he had his anti-access area denial array set up already. So he had all the, he mastered all the aspects of the gray zone. He would test and probe, okay? Um, now, and then he would try to get great power intervention. And then he had his anti-access area denial array to defend himself when I gave chase. Now, the difference between this kind of kit play and real world gray zone activity is of course, in the real world, gray zone actors don't want to provoke a response. They want to just provoke until, or they want to act just before they cause the adversary to respond. And in the current world, most of them are, there are, they are themselves great powers and they are strategically lonely. So they don't have an alliance, they don't have an alliance network to draw on, okay? Whereas my brother had the great powers, our parents to try to, you know, to get involved. So I think this is, even a kid can understand this stuff. So it's rooted kind of in universal human psychology. Let me just talk quickly about asymmetry. I think in the Iranian case, everybody says Iran is an asymmetric actor. Everybody, everybody's asymmetric actor. We all use our strengths against enemy weaknesses um, and try to turn the enemy's strengths into vulnerabilities. The most important element of asymmetry for Iran is actions that yield disproportionate effects. So for instance, the Marine barracks bombing, which was done by a group with what, uh, uh, from what was eventually to become Hezbollah, was carried out by one, one man, okay? Although he had a support network, killed 241 Marines and uh, Navy, Navy corpsmen. And within a few months, we were out of Lebanon. So one bombing got us out of Lebanon, okay? Um, likewise, um, the attacks on Aramco in September of last year, 24, I believe, drones and, and cruise missiles created a big psychological impact on America's allies, Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE, revealing how vulnerable their oil infrastructure was. And because we didn't respond, that had a multiplier effect on the psychological impact. So just a few drones and cruise missiles had a big, big impact in terms of you know, demonstrating Iran's precision strike capability. Now, Iran relies on four elements of asymmetry in particular. Conceptual, okay? The whole aspect of gray zone conflict relies on an American binary approach to warfare that you're either at peace or you're at war. And, and there's this big gray zone between that gives them freedom of action to act, okay? So they could use proxies and the like in that gray zone. So the conceptual asymmetry between the way we think about conflict and the Iranian approach, which conceives of a conflict continuum, which gives them many, you know, many uh, a, a, a fair space to act, is the main asymmetry that they exploit. But there's also operational asymmetries. They have proxies and we do not, okay? We can act on our own in an unacknowledged way or a deniable way, but we don't really have proxies the way that the Iranians do with all these Shiite foreign legions as uh, Ambassador Chinoy men mentioned. There's temporal asymmetries, okay? We have, uh, our presidents are elected for four-year terms, okay? They might have an eight-year term in the end if they get reelected. 
but the, they only have two years or two and a half years at the beginning of their administration, and then they're in re-election mode. And nobody wants to start a conflict while they're running for re-election. Whereas Iran, the supreme leader, has been the, 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 the real leader since 1989. Um, Qasem Soleimani was the head of the Quds Force since 1998 or so. And so the main decision makers with regard to national, national security are unelected, and they don't have to worry about public opinion, and they have a long time horizon. So they could play the long game in ways that we cannot. That's another asymmetry they exploit. And finally, moral and motivational asymmetries. We are a great power with worldwide commitments. We cannot focus on any one thing for a long period of time, whereas Iran is in the game 24 seven. This is their vital interest every day of the week. So there's, you know, and, and from their point of view, they are, they are fighting to advance their vital interest. For us, this is not a vital interest. It's, a, it's an important interest, but not a vital interest. So there's, a, there's that asymmetry and motivation. And then finally, with regard to the hybrid approach, okay, um, everybody, we are hybrid actors. Iran is hybrid actors, is a hybrid actor. So you have, and there's two elements, there's a binary or a hybrid nature to hybridity. Hybridity refers to both organizational forms, okay, um, that uh, the organizational divide uh, the design is hybrid. So you have both regular forces in Iran and the Revolutionary Guard. And within the Revolutionary Guard, you have regular forces and the Quds Force. You also have the Basij, okay, and the regular army, okay. Um, and, they, and they also use these forces together to achieve synergies. And they also use other activities, criminal activities, such as um, fostering corruption in Iraq um, and business activities in Iraq to cultivate local um, supporters, which they can use for intelligence and other purposes to support their policy. So they, I think they are better than us because we are limited by legal considerations with regard to the use of cash and money and money bags. We cannot, we cannot engage in corruption and corrupting foreign politicians, whereas Iran is able to do so to advance its 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 activities, so it, it's more they have their problems there, but they're they have more of an all of government approach than we do. Um, let me just ask: the, are, are the slides are the slides up? Um, because I don't see them. I just wanted to ask because I wanted to. It's it, it's not necessary if uh, if need be, but if the slides. If you be, if you wish to show the slides, we will ask the webmaster to show us the slides. That's not a problem. Okay. Yeah, it would be it would be useful now. Um, it would be useful. Please do the, the needful. Up. Yeah, so let me just, I'll keep talking in the meanwhile. And um, okay, so if you could bring it up to full screen mode and if you could go to, I think the third page now. Okay, uh, one more, one more after that, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much. So, okay, basically, so Iran's, uh, uh, the reason why Iran, you know, uses this gray zone approach is because of their overriding desire to avoid conventional war because of the trauma of the Iran-Iraq war. They also saw how easy it was for the United States, United States to start a war, in, to start wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but how hard it was to disengage, okay? So it's all about avoiding conventional war, okay? Um, if you look at the bottom of this screen and see the elements of Iran's way of war, which are based on its strategic culture. You see, and, and, and I've underlined a whole bunch of factors, which I consider to be parts of their way of war. Many of these are, are many, of their, many of their way of war is shaped in order to um, manage risk and the potential for escalation. So for instance, forward defense, you know, engaging in activities in Syria or Yemen in order to keep the wolf Far from the borders. If you are engaged in, um, you know, dealing with your adversaries far from the borders of the country, the stakes are less, and you will have more latitude for action. Okay. Likewise, tactical flexibility. Iran will push, but when they find, you know, when they uh, uh, perceive a firm response, they will back off, and they will try to figure out alternative ways forward. Okay. They are not dogmatic in their approach, kind of doubling down on on what they see to be an unsuccessful or dangerous way forward, okay? I, I mentioned indirection and ambiguity. Again, that, that the use of proxies advances that, okay? If a, there is a proxy attack, there's always the question, were they acting on their own? Were they acting on Iranian orders? 
um, if they were acting on Iranian orders? Was it the Revolutionary Guard and not the Supreme Leader? Do we want to escalate because of something that maybe some local commander did? So it creates all kinds of ambiguity in the minds of the adversary about how to respond. How to respond. Okay. Um, let me just. I'm going to mention also protract rather than escalate conflicts. The traditional American approach very often has been to escalate in order to achieve decisive um, um, results um, or to bring a conflict to a head. Um, and it's built into our whole kind of our, our whole operational uh, construct. We used to talk about decisive operations. We, now we talk about dominate. But the, the idea very often is the same kind of, you know, achieve some kind of decisive blow. Whereas Iran, again, their approach, rather than escalate, because escalation is dangerous, they protract the conflict over time. And we see that not just vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but also vis-a-vis -vis in 2009, in the way they handled the Green Movement, the domestic opposition was the same approach. It wasn't like Tiananmen Square, where the Chinese army went out and ran over all the protesters and crushed the opposition. They were much more careful and they handled it the way they handled it, and they dealt with it over time by attriting and undermining the morale of the opposition. Okay. They also managed the tempo and scope of operations in a way to limit the potential for escalation. And this is very important. Rather than having um, activities that are clo you know, close together in, in, in time and in space, they spread them out in time and space to limit the potential for escalation. Very important part of the, their kind of uh, operational art. Okay. And then, Using proxies enables them to offload risks and burden, burdens on others. Okay, and then finally, much of what they have done is to, in, in recent years, has been to diversify and expand their gray zone toolbox. Because the more tools you have, the more you're able to escalate horizontally rather than vertically. Okay, um, which again enables you to manage uh, conflict and manage the potential for escalation. Next, next page, please. I could have the next page in the in the briefing, please. Thank you. Okay, so here I put it all together. I rem remember I said before, I want to understand how gray zone asymmetry, hybridity, how they all fit together, and how they fit together with our the way that we think about strategy, ways, means to achieve ends. Okay, so I put it all together here, and 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 when I thought about it, um, when I thought about it, gray zone approaches. Asymmetric approaches, hybrid approaches are all the ways, although hybrid, like I said, has a hybrid nature. So the hybrid approach involves both ways and means because you use the hybrid force in a hybrid way, okay? Exploiting its asymmetries and by acting in the gray zone. And so, and here, the main end is to advance your interests while deterring or avoiding conventional wars, okay? So all, all kinds of kind of comes together here. And then the important part is to see is that there's this, this feedback loop, okay? So as you act on your adversary, you because this is a long game, you determine what impact your actions had on your adversary. So you test, you observe, you learn, and you adjust. You adjust your gray zone approach. So it's, it's very experimental, which all strategy should be. A strategy should be a learning process, okay? So you have this feedback loop. Okay, so let me let me get to okay the next page, please, and I'm going to wrap it up in a in a few minutes. So I'm not going to go all, over all of these, but these are all elements that Iran has used in their gray zone toolkit. I think the important thing to notice here is that many of these activities are non-lethal. Okay, Americans tend to be very much wrapped up with lethality. So you see in our national defense strategy, it talks about creating a, a more lethal force. But I would argue to succeed in the gray zone, you actually need to have a broader range of both non-lethal, less lethal, as well as lethal options. So you need to work on electronic warfare means, um, electro, um, um, you know, uh, uh, millimeter uh, or microwave weapons. Um, various types of non-lethal weapons. Look at the Iranian attacks. The first, the first seven months of their counter-pressure campaign starting last May against the, against the United States and our, and our allies. So you had non-lethal attacks on tankers, okay? And, and the limpet mines were attached in order to limit the potential for 
harming the crews. So they were right by the bow and they were toward the, um, the, 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 the far raft of the ships, right? They shot down an American UAV. So many of their activities were intended to achieve non-lethal effects, but psycho, you know, profound, still profound psychological effects, even though they were non-lethal. So to operate successfully in the gray zone, you need to have as robust a toolkit as possible to give you as many options as possible without vertical escalation. Next page, please. And actually, actually one more, if you don't mind, please. It's one more page, okay. So I'm not gonna, you know, this is mainly for an American audience in terms of how the America, how America I think should act differently vis-a-vis -vis Iran. But I, I simply wanna just, you know, from a policy point of view, demonstrate how um, I've kind of applied these principles in the current case against Iran. Again, the main point is to bolster deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Now, the main problem I think the United States has had been, has been restoring credibility because seven months of inaction in the face of Iranian activities in the Gulf led them to eventually escalate to the point that we lost lost a, uh, um, a contractor in, in Iraq, and then we lost two other soldiers as well as a, a British soldier in March. Okay, so the point is, we went between doing nothing and then in December going way up the escalatory ladder to killing Qasem Soleimani, okay? And so I would argue that we need to find a more consistent middle ground approach to acting. Um, and again, consistency is important in order to, um, because like I said, the adversary will keep testing and keep escalating um, until, they, until they either get a response or they achieve their goals. So you have to act more consistently more often at a lower level than I would argue we've, we've acted. You have to play on the adversary's desire to avoid escalation and warfare, okay? So everything they do is to manage risk, prevent escalation. So what you need to do is you, you, you cannot be predictable. If you are predictable, then you enable the adversary to, cal to, to manage risk, to calculate what he can get away with, okay? So you need to be unpredictable. And I would argue that even though I think perhaps the killing of Qasem Soleimani last January may have been a, a wrong move, although, you know, look, we won't know for another year. It, it may turn out to have been a stroke of genius. We don't know, it's too early to tell. I just wouldn't, I would not have advocated for, at the, for that at the time, but I would argue that to the degree that that really created unpredictability and uncertainty in the minds of the Iranians, about how we might respond in the future, it maybe was helpful, okay? So you need to be unpredictable in your actions and not act in a tit-for-tat manner, which, which is typically how Americans act because we wanna be consistent with the law of armed conflict, which requires discrimination, proportionality, um, and the like. But I would argue the law of armed, armed, armed conflict allows us to act in a way that is still unpredictable, but in accordance with the law of armed conflict. So if a surface to air missile shoots down our drone, we don't have to attack just a surface to air missile. We could attack targets that are more important for the adversary in response to deter future actions. And then also finally, we have to both seek, we have to think about going long, going not going big. That's always for Americans, that's a big problem because we have, because escalation dominance is one of our asymmetric advantages. So we're always tempted to escalate. And that's not always a good idea because like I said, it creates domestic problems politically. It created problems in Iraq. So we need to go long and think about achieving advantage by incremental cumulative gains and not through rapid, bold actions and pursuing knockout blows. And then finally, we have to expand our gray zone toolkit to give us more options for acting in the gray zone. So anyhow, I will end on this point. I hope this was useful for you. Um, I'm simply trying, to, I'm not trying to start a discussion about Iran. I'm simply really actually want to kick off a discussion about ways of war. And I would like to hear about Iran, uh, Indian thoughts ab about how, th whether this applies to you, whether this is useful in, in, in dealing with your own national security challenges. So anyhow, I'll conclude it on this. And I, I see there's some questions on the right here. So um, if you wanna, you're welcome to take the, um, the, the slides off the screen. 
you have the, anybody who wants the slides are welcome to them. Um, you're you're welcome to distribute those to your you. to your staff and anybody who attended here. And um, I'm just uh, like to start off the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Eisenstadt, for those uh, uh, very very helpful comments. Now, since I have uh, five minutes to my credit, I want to actually uh, set the ball rolling for the discussions by commenting a little bit on what you said. And maybe you will come in in the second round in the Q and A session as well. Great. Meanwhile, may I suggest that all speakers uh, continually look at the chat box so that they can familiarize themselves with the questions as they pour in. I will try to summarize them at the end, but it'll be helpful if you can take a peek now and then into your chat box. Now, you know, you seem to suggest that uh, basically there is this uh, gray zone uh, which uh, is commensurate with hybrid, with asymmetric. And then you went on to show a little uh, sort of dissection of overt and covert. And I also got the impression that you were suggesting the US should move towards uh, a more of a gray zone approach uh, than the kick the door down and use overwhelming force as it is normally attuned to doing. Uh, of course, that you can lay squarely at the fact, uh, the door of the fact that it is uh, continues to be uh, a hyperpower, you know, and it's been a superpower in the past, and therefore there is that uh, uh, intrinsic need to dominate and to also, once you start a fight, to use whatever force is necessary to, uh, you know, have an emphatic victory. So it comes naturally to a bigger power, to a hyperpower, to a superpower. Uh, now there were some nuanced uh, remarks that you made, which uh, I want to. Uh, bring out for you. Uh, now, for instance, if the US were to move to a gray zone, um, you obviously cannot use the entire toolkit that you showed because uh, the US certainly doesn't want to go down the road of kidnappings, uh, as you seem to suggest uh, the toolkit comprises. You certainly don't want to go on to, uh, you know, occupy embassies. Uh, you, you don't want to carry out uh, operations that in the gray zone can easily fall into the category of terrorism in global perceptions so there is obviously uh, you know you're trading on thin ice there when you advocate a policy of a gray zone approach it's also not true that the united states has never used a gray zone approach i would imagine that every military uh, you know uses a gray zone approach alongside whatever it is that it is otherwise trained to do and that would have been applicable in iraq it would have been applicable equally before in afghanistan and to an extent would continue to be applicable there um, your brother, by the way, had attribution, the story that you told us, there was no deniability there. But uh, when there is deniability, I want to suggest that, uh, uh, you know, deterrence is lost to a certain extent. Because if you, uh, you know, don't uh, uh, hit the home run, as you put it, uh, and you don't uh, accept attribution, uh, you are also moving into an area where you encourage a simmering low level of conflict without any outcomes. Uh, so uh, it's an encouragement to a simmering below the, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, threshold warfare that is, as you said, long game, uh, but it's also prolonged and therefore no outcomes. So therefore I want to suggest to you that the gray zone also results in uh, a kind of engagement that does not necessarily alter behavior. Now, if your starting point is that something is unacceptable uh, and that you need to alter behavior through, uh, you know, negotiations first, and if negotiations face, fail through, uh, you know, the use of uh, warlike means, then uh, having gray zone approach with deniability does not necessarily cause the other party to alter behavior because it is prolonged, because there is no attribution, there is therefore no deterrence. And uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, areas where uh, it can just continue till the cows come home. Uh, now, I don't think the United States in a, is in a position today, even today, where it can reconcile itself with such outcomes. And therefore, I'd like to hear the others, uh, you know, say that uh, uh, in due course. Uh, uh, well, that was basically what I wanted to say. Uh, and uh, I now move to uh, our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Michael Connell. Dr. Michael Connell, you have 10 minutes and then I'll move, uh, run through other speakers as well. The floor is yours.
Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please, please proceed. Okay, excellent. Um, so I thought I'd begin by commenting on something that, that Mike said. I think it was an excellent presentation. I also want to thank IDSA, repeat basically Mike's thanks, and thank Ambassador um, Mina and IDSA, IDSA for hosting this, this webinar. Um, Mike made a very interesting point about, about communicating strategically using discrete means. Um, using sort of gray zone messaging, I guess you could call it. And I, I think it was it was an interesting point, and I um, I'd be curious to get Mike's thoughts. Though the asymmetric on this topic, which is the asymmetric nature of the competition, makes sometimes makes strategic strategic signaling between the U.S. and Iran difficult. Um, we, we, it's you're dealing with two forces and and two means that are are so different. That sometimes the communication gets somewhat confused, and I'm wondering if if you push if you push some of that signaling into the gray zone, um, I wonder if if there's room for miscommunication um, that wouldn't be there if you were communicating sort of overtly. You know, I like to think of uh, you know here at the Center for Naval Analyses, basically we work a lot with the U.S. Navy. And the U.S. Navy thinks about strategic signaling a lot um, with adversaries, with competitors. Um, when they, when we've we've tried to message Iran and the Gulf in the past, the means we've used have been very overt. I mean, we've 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 gone through third parties to send messages. You know, obviously, U.S. doesn't have a relationship with Iran, so we go through. Um, third parties to pass messages. We we issue public statements. So when we do something, there's always an accompanying um, public affairs officer who says, "This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it." I don't think those messages are always received. I think there's a lot of skepticism, perhaps on the Iranian side about them. But I think there is a there is a potential when you're dealing with gray zone competition for miscommunication, and um, and um, escalation. Um, I'll, I'll just go quickly because a lot of my, I had prepared some comments on the salient features as I saw them of, of Iran's approach to gray zone competition. Um, um, but it, it pales in comparison with Mike's, um, Mike's um, speech so far. And I, he raised a lot of the points already. I, I totally agree that I think their approach is opportunistic. Um, I think they tend to favor emergent strategies rather than deliberative strategies in their approach to competition. A lot of people have said that the Iranians uh, play chess. In fact, uh, Iranians claim they invented the game, although I've also heard that um, India might have invented the game as well, but the Iranians call it shatranj. Um, I tend to look at it as, as I see them playing more checkers in this competition. Um, and Mike made this point, but essentially they're always probing and testing um, they're not overly wedded to doctrine or traditional approaches to warfare or competition. This is especially true of the IRGC, given the, the nature of that organization. But it's to a certain extent, it's true of the, the Artesh, the regular forces as well. Um, they like experimenting. Um, when you look at their tactics, they, they're always trying new tactics, new ways of doing things. Um, I totally agree with Mike's comment, by the way, on their their um, their strategic patience. Um, they really do play a long game. Um, and as Mike noted, I, you know, in my interactions with policymakers and um, and um, military officers here in the U.S., it's we're just not well suited for that kind of um, that form of competition. Uh, the phrase "go hard, go home" comes to mind here. Um, we aren't patient as Americans. We like to solve things and and we like it. It's either black or white. You know, we're 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 involved or we're not involved. We seek decisive outcomes. And uh, this just isn't suited to kind of long term gray uh, gray zone competition. Um, I'll I, one other comment I do want to make. This is this might be somewhat controversial, but I think when the Iranians compete with us in the gray zone. There's a certain element of proportionality at play. Um, you know, given that the 
the competition has been asymmetric. We don't always see Iran's actions as proportional. Um, we tend to view their actions as escalatory, but I, I, you know, looking at it from the Iranian perspective, looking at how they describe these interactions, I really see it as, as there's some element of proportionality um, baked into that. Um, they certainly don't want to engage in a high-end conflict with the U.S., and that's obvious to me, and I think it's obvious to any Iran watchers. And I think they also, um, conversely, they count on us not wanting to get into a high-end conflict as well. So to a certain extent, they're taking advantage, I think, of, of um, the U.S. being somewhat risk-averse in this area. But I'll, I'll conclude with that. Uh, I want to yield some time to the other speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michael Connell, and thank you for giving us uh, very useful comments. Uh, I think uh, the discussants may kindly comment a little bit on the difference between gray zone tactics and uh, what we might otherwise call, you know, uh, backroom or, or backdoor diplomacy. Uh, and in democracies, incidentally, uh, a gray zone tactic may also invite uh, censure. Uh, now, we have seen it happen in the United States of America in the Iran-Contra affair. I mean, if Langley gets uh, too involved, uh, then you can have an Iran-Contra kind of situation uh, and uh, you can have a lot of, uh, you know, congressional and other hearings and reports and people want to know what exactly happened, who authorized it. Uh, so that in, a, in any kind of democracy, I think uh, gray zone creates a questions of its own. It's just a thought that I leave before you. And final thought for the other discussants is, is that when we speak of proportionality and add a little bit in the equation uh, by way of deterrence, it really equals in any case escalatory uh, behavior. Uh, and uh, therefore, either side in this kind of proportional gray zone activity tends to uh, in the eye of the other, add a little more by way of deterrence. But of course, that causes the whole thing to spiral up gradually. Uh, next speaker is Major General B.K. Sharma, Director of the United Service Institution of India. The floor is yours, please. Ten minutes. Uh, please do unmute your mic. Uh, please do unmute your mic. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Chenoy, uh, Mr. Michael, and Mother of co panelists. In fact, uh, my comments are going to be based on uh, the monograph which Mr. Michael has written and also uh, the lecture that he has just been. And I would say that uh, this subject is highly topical and uh, it is flavor of the season and it helps us here in India a great deal. Uh, in the sense that we are also beset with the Lucio hybrid threats and we've been facing the gray zone conflict, both from Pakistan and now even China is achieving a certain degree of sophistication in that. To that extent, your articulation is going to help us a great deal in understanding the entire spectrum of conflict right, right from uh, the non-classical uh, Sort of domain to the classical domain, wherein we will start from non contact, non kinetic warfare, and go up the escalation ladder right up to the nuclear factor in our own strategic calculus vis a vis Pakistan and China. I'm also a net assessor, and I think your entire frame of your uh, monograph will help me in understanding the cause, effect, uh, consequences, outcomes, and response model of our own calculation with China and Pakistan in a collusive setting. Having said that, my comments are basically uh, to just flag two issues which you have mentioned in your uh, monograph and subsequently uh, alluded in your talk. And first thing is you talked about you actually established uh, and ways and means relationship. And then you said how these are aligned to a strategic logic. Now, when I look at your end state of Iran and particularly the long-term strategic interest, you have mentioned about, you know, to become a regional hegemon and US influence and eliminate Israel. 
Now, to my way of looking at, you know, to end U.S. influence and uh, to end Israel, these are probably unachievable kind of uh, uh, end states that you have articulated in your. You may like to rethink over this. Likewise, you very nicely brought out, you know, the what is the grand strategic orientation of this phase on conflict of uh, Iran that Iran wants to secure its home base and go for a forward strategic step by actually creating proxy wars in other regional regional states which are Shia dominant and keep its uh, employment of its troops to the minimum. In this whole matrix that you have identified, the center of gravity, this is the clergy of uh, Iran, which is the ideological inspiration. And then is the IRGC, you know, which is actually uh, the actual prosecutioner of this gray zone conflict. And then you talked about, you know, a gorilla navy. You talked about UAVs and ballistic missiles. You also talked about a stable of foreign proxies, which you have very nicely described in your paper. And you talked about Iran's cyber warfare capabilities. But one factor which may actually become relevant in times to come is the nuclear factor. The way you know, Iran is improving its nuclear posture and nuclear armament. If in due course they are able to produce some kind of a design material, that may become even another part of its, uh, uh, you know, uh, asymmetric warfare capabilities and having deterrence capabilities. You also define the end state that United States of America wants to achieve. And the, in the long term, you have said that they want to weaken the Islamic regime. And you have put 10 determinants of, you know, how they want to, how this uh, gray zone conflict should be prosecuted. I'll not get into those, those 10 determinants. But your last determinant there is a long game of catalyzing regime contradiction. But in your own articulation and in your own monograph, you have not labored much on how should the United States of America go about uh, and exploiting the internal contradictions of uh, Iran. Two other uh, areas which I feel you may like to look at is the whole geopolitical and historical perspective from my way of looking at things. No matter what we say, United States of America still remains an auxiliar because the whole tension or the rivalry in the region is predicated on Sunni Shia or Arab and Persian rivalries, which date back to actually 7th century. And there have been a number of datum points in between, whether it was, you know, Ali not getting the succession and then, you know, the assassination of uh, Hassan. And subsequently, you had the Iranian revolution, you had Iran-Iraq war. And in U.S. approach to Iran, wherein at one hand, they tried to reach out to them, and on the other hand, they applied this maximum pressure, which is now going on, and in between tried to have GCPOA. So there is a kind of an in the entire approach of United States of America, which doesn't help with the kind of strategy that you are trying to articulate. Towards the end, I would say that what actually is the end state of United States of America towards Iran? Do we want to and to want to weaken and replace the Islamist regime there, or we want to moderate its behavior. Because the whole strategic orientation will actually be driven or will devolve around this basic assumption. And in that, I would like to say that you have to revisit your assumption whether Iranian regime of theocrats will change their behavior, or you will have to have a hard power and more stringent, more I would say, a determined gray zone conflict to begin with. And there are a large number of things that we need to actually look at. One is the internal resistance. You talked about the green movement. And there are other fault lines since 2017, which are erupting in Iran, despite, you know, clergy showing a very brave face. How does what the United States of America wish to do with those internal fault lines, be it student union, labor union, the oil workers, the other reformists, and a whole lot of other things. 
Another issue that we need to look at is how are we going to weaken the proxies of Israel, uh, of Iran, be it in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, all these places. And what do you do with Hezbollah, Qatai, Hezbollah, and such like other organizations? Because there are indicators that these can be weakened. And there was an uprising in Lebanon and also in Iraq against Iranian occupation. So what are you going to do about it? Similarly, how are you going to leverage Israel, Syria, and other allies actually to put more pressure on Iran? I think a little bit more effort is required to work on those things. But finally, I would say that while at this stage you've been advocating a more strident strategy towards Iran, but if you look at the geopolitical realities today, uh, United States of America is withdrawing from Afghanistan. You cannot play your Taliban card against the Iranians. Likewise, you also, you know, have thrown, thinned down your troops from Syria. And the 5,000 odd troops that you have in Iraq, there is ground swell of resistance against them. And maybe that there is a critical uncertainty that one fine day Trump might say that we would like to withdraw even from Iraq. If these geopolitical factors on ground, they do not hold water, then this whole gray zone strategy will actually go for a six. So in the light of my comments, perhaps you may like to revisit some of your assumptions and some of your analysis. And finally, we have to now factor in the COVID. COVID now and post-COVID war, what changes are going to come about in the strategic behavior of some of these players and how United States of America is going to recalibrate its strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Sharma. Again, very, very enlightening comments, very useful. And I'm glad that you also raised that question about whether gray zone activity will get, uh, say, for instance, a regime, a particular regime, to change its behavior. Um, there's also this business of uh, the United States being present in that geographical zone in a prolific manner, spread across numerous bases, many lily pads, and then having to resort to a gray zone approach to my mind is a little contradictory. You will then have to also look at the reconciliation of a presence versus your reluctance to use any kind of uh, overt, overwhelming force to bring about certain outcomes. So uh, I think that's something that you may also wish to consider. Um, I now invite uh, Commodore Abhay Kumar uh, to make his uh, remarks. Uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Eisenstadt, uh, for a excellent uh, presentations. Our previous two commentators have uh, largely uh, provided the overview. Uh, my being here on the subject uh, is a project which we did in IDSA in uh, 2017. Uh, and we came out with a uh, book on the hydro hybrid warfare. Uh, based on our study of a survey of uh, hybrid and gray zone activities across the globe, actors, theaters, and essentially to draw some kind of lessons which pertains to us. Uh, fundamentally, democracies are challenged in responding uh, to hybrid or gray zone uh, Activities both are, as you brought out, are nuanced and different and should not be used interchangeably. Fundamental difference is largely nation states are uh, constrained by the norms, international norms, uh, law of warfare, which governs our conduct, and more so democracies are constrained by their own domestic nature of policy. Dealing with the gray zone uh, requires a nation to view their approach for a long term, and it's a game of patience. Uh, among the uh, others whom we sur uh, surveyed, uh, probably effective response or a kind of a strategic approach towards this, uh, we saw uh, some in Israel where uh, there is a spectrum of response, both kinetic and non-kinetic, they apply to deal with the threat. Uh, fundamentally, again, uh, as uh, General Sharma brought out, there are geopolitical challenges. 
again dealing with the challenges unless you address the underlying issues you are dealing with the symptoms not with the disease so those are the uh, basic and uh, i really enjoyed uh, reading your monograph or iran in our own book it covers into two of the chapters on uh, lebanon and yemen and uh, syria and iraq uh and uh, what kind of actors which kind of motivation of course iran is the not only one in that there are multiplicity of actors involved uh, uh doing uh, their own activities some of them uh, hybrid uh, and gray zone uh, combined now in so far as uh, iran is concerned i will only uh, disagree with the monograph approach that fundamentally they have a a uh, rather broad design as i think the other discussant brought out uh, there is also uh, responding to impulses and fundamentally again they are dealing with their own sense of insecurity uh, seeing in a geographical zone where they are uh, their their own regional competition and their response and fundamentally because iran's insecurity in recent years has uh, further accentuated uh because of uh, extra regional presence in two of its critical neighborhood that is iraq and afghanistan so that's has accentuated its kind of insecurity which is also led to uh, some kind of and of course in uh, in its own uh, defense it has created proxies uh, to uh, pursue its strategic objective and it keep others imbalanced at the same time he uh, they have also uh, chosen to uh, hans their deterrence by uh, reflecting or uh, uh, transmitting a kind of unpredictability the predictability in their approach that uh, if you do probably what they will do next is largely so that unpredictability is has worked out in a slight of a strength one of the in paper in dealing with those approaches which you have dealt with that you need to build deterrence that's uh, absolutely but whether deterrence by denial or deterrence by punishment monograph prefers both uh, in our finding we argue that deterrence by denial in dealing with the gray zone approach is a better than deterrence by punishment uh, fundamentally deterrence by punishment is articulated threat in order to uh, modify behavior of the adversary and in that case uh, often after the incident uh the responder is dealing with the kind of possible consequences which again restrains its behavior and in that case uh, once broken uh, the deter uh, deterrence by punishment approach it further embodies the approach so deterrence by denial uh, in terms of uh, not allowing his strategic objective to achieve is a uh, better approach now uh, fundamentally again in dealing with uh, gray zone approaches of any kind of adversary uh, what we need is a approach towards altering behavior and that remains a challenge and fundamental difficulty here is which we have found that a uh, narrative control by the responder is also at a times because of the ambiguity non attributability uh, is uh, often found missing and that's where you are uh, unless you are able to constantly pose and paint Uh, your adversary in a negative light uh, he is not going to modify or he will have no uh, indication to modify its own behavior i think i'll stop here sir and uh, with the any question i will take thank you commodore abhay kumar uh, this was again a very fascinating uh, set of observations that you made very useful and comes from the fact that you worked in the institute on this subject before i now turn to uh someone who we should also thank for having put this together dr meena singh roy um so she is the center coordinator uh, for our own center that ought to be named after her meena <laughs> uh so <laughs> the west asia center we could also name it meena after dr meena singh roy the floor is yours 10 minutes please i hope i am audible thank you sir and uh, we uh, actually uh, meena is a, such a common name that you can relate it to any uh, region any uh, country it's a, it's a pretty common name from uh, uh, asia to europe or, or to uh, west asia uh, actually but uh, i have my special thanks to both michaels for uh, coming on board and speaking on iran 
and uh, secondly to general sharma and uh, our own uh, you know i mean uh, mr abhay kumar uh, that's one now iran is actually you know i don't want to get into the military um, uh, dynamics of it i'm sure you know we've had uh, good speakers on that but when we are looking at iran and there are two questions uh, that i have to uh, michael uh, one is uh, you know you have talked about in both your you know i've read a lot of your uh, writings the first question that i have uh, to you is before i come to some of my comments one is how do you uh, really turn you know the enemy's strength into vulnerabilities that you've often talked about uh the second is uh, has iran been deterred by threat of punishment and denial uh these are the two questions the third uh, issue that i want to uh, flag here is the iranian behavior uh which is uh, been uh, pretty much unpredictable at times uh, i would say uh second thing is when we talk about the gray zone and how to deal with iran Uh, in the present context when the focus i mean at least there is a perception in the region that united states is uh, changing its focus from uh, you know middle east to uh, you know asia pacific uh, in uh, number one number two i mean if we you are looking at the gray zone uh, you know strategy and dg did my dg commented on on the issue of of democracy and how difficult it would be for the uh, for the countries uh, you know who are uh, following the democratic norms and values in that sense can we can you know you really emulate uh, what iran does i mean if we look at iran's strategic assets and for me uh, these are like they have real partners which is uh, hamas you know uh, then the strategic allies like houthis then the ideological allies like hezbollah and proxies of course uh, one example is syrian national defense forces does what are uh, us uh, strategic assets if we have to compare it that to uh, number one why i mean what are the real us goals in the changed context today uh, is it uh, as as general sharma pointed out regime change uh, or is it uh, you know the the uh, behavior that they would expect from the present regime uh, to change uh, their uh, under the present circumstances with the support that they have from russia and china how far you know russian and the chinese would be committed to the iranian cause that one can debate but uh, as far as the the us uh, you know changed uh, policy is concerned where you know there is uh, difference of opinion when we're talking about the us and and china uh, the russia and china so i don't know in it, it's it's pretty complicated scenario you see you know the russians and the chinese partnering together on certain issues and on other issues you know uh, they are not uh, very comfortable with iran uh so that i i think uh, the the geopolitics uh, is something which uh, needs to be uh, you know figured out when we are talking about how to deal with iran will iran change its behavior uh, i think the the capability and the potential of iran uh, has has uh, probably uh, been uh, uh, affected uh, will they be able to provide the same kind of financial support that they did in past or you know will it uh, the 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 uh, you know irgc and the hardcore elements within iran would continue to pursue i mean they have been weakened now if they have been weakened under those circumstances what should be the us policies today we do see even the gulf partners like you know uae and uh, saudi arabia welcoming the russians and the chinese so in in that context what should be the future course of united states in the changed context when you wrote the monograph i'm sure things were very different but today i'm sure in future how should united states uh, you know place itself uh, to protect its interest which are completely different from what it was whether you know protecting its allies interest and i think israel has not been mentioned uh, much here uh, how 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 is this going to affect 
uh, you know, in, I don't think United States uh, would withdraw from the region. That is merely a perception. And uh, constantly the American generals and, you know, the policymakers have also talked about how much engaged they are despite, you know, their uh, uh, focus towards, uh, you know, Indo-Pacific and uh, other issues. I would stop here, but I would definitely say, you know, dealing uh, with Iran, uh, I somehow feel, you know, engaging Iran directly would help, uh, you know, de-escalate a situation. And uh, that's, that's how I feel about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Meena Singh Roy. Uh, my basic point uh, all along uh, to draw you out uh, really is that a force is to be uh, meaningful. If it has to achieve its ends, it must largely be attributable. And um, if there is uh, deniability, if there is uh, you know, uh, too much of a gray zone approach, uh, I'm not sure how you would reconcile that with uh, what President Roosevelt had also said that speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. Uh, so the whole notion of carrying a big stick uh, is to also make it quite apparent who's carrying the stick. Uh, because I, I don't know how you can bring about behavioral changes in terms of your military or uh, diplomatic or strategic objectives without uh, uh, that exhibition. Uh, it's uh, in the world of nature, you have it uh in you know the the, the world of uh, strategy and, and military affairs also it has to be quite self-apparent as to what the outcomes might be as a result of actions a b and c uh, so that's something that uh, i need to obviously study a little more and i do appreciate uh, all the, the very very important points that have been made by our speakers now i want to go over to the q a session briefly summarize it for you uh, first question, what are the Iranian objectives long and short term pursuing a hybrid gray zone threshold operations uh, in the area west of Iran, as in particularly uh, Yemen, Lebanon, um, uh, and um, also Syria, um, perhaps on, on the other side in Afghanistan? A question for uh, Michael, but of course that doesn't uh, tell me which Michael at this stage. <laughs> Uh, but both the Michaels can answer this question. Please explain the concept of strategic patience used by Iran. And uh, I'm sure Mr. Michael Eisenstadt would have the first go at that. Uh, then uh, again for Dr. Eisenstadt, uh, could you please compare the Iranian approach with that of the Pakistani army's ISI against US soldiers in Afghanistan? Now, of course, that's a good question because Pakistan operates a great deal more uh, in, in gray space uh, and has been doing so for a long time. Uh, also, would you would your proposed approach not destabilize the power equilibrium in the Gulf region in which the US is so heavily invested? I'm adding the word heavily. Yeah. Then another question, what is your opinion on psychological warfare being part of Iran's uh, uh, asymmetric gray zone? There may be some repetitions here, of course. Uh, another question, can you give examples of various methods being employed with what aims uh, and outcomes uh, in specific operations? Some concrete examples. Also, perhaps concrete example of where the U.S. might have successfully used uh, the gray zone approach and, and achieved its ends. Um, uh, then we have our, D, our defense attaché who's signed in from uh, Tel Aviv. Um, he wants to know how does Israel figure in Iran's uh, scheme of things? Is it an ideological uh, confrontation as in between Islam and Judaism um, or a Western socio-civilizational entity being juxtaposed in the Middle East? Is that a contradiction or is it more strategic as in uh, there being a major power there in Israel that can actually challenge the strategic uh, dom dominance that uh, otherwise Iran is capable of? Um, is it seen as an agent of the U.S. or is, is what's the historical context to this? Uh, so um, uh, two more here. Uh, what would be the possible outcomes if Washington undertakes the gray zone approach? And how will Tehran react to this, uh, to U.S. changing stance, uh, changing uh, track and, and moving over to that track? Uh, another one, uh, Iran is Iran winning the uh, narrative war in West Asia and other parts of the world, 
Has it exploited U.S. support for Gulf monarchies and uh, the Palestinian issue to its advantage, um, which may resonate with other powers? And on the screen here, not to leave out one more, uh, again from the defense attaché of India and Israel, uh, he wants to know what would be Turkey's outlook to uh, Iran's actions uh, for the long term, similarly for Russia. Uh, with uh, uh, my having actually done the run the gauntlet of the chat box, I once again invite uh, Dr. Michael Eisenstadt to take the floor. Uh, perhaps uh, about three to four minutes, maybe uh, as, as, as you are the lead speaker, maybe you can take five minutes and then I will okay. request the others to uh, utilize a little less time. Go ahead, please. Great. I'm going to be very quick and very, very telegraphic and try to answer as many of these as quickly as possible. I'm just going to go down the list here. Okay. There's no doubt that the U.S. has to stay within the law of armed conflict in developing our gray zone toolkit. So hostage taking that that was the Iranian toolkit. We have to develop our own toolkit, which is consistent with our values and the law of armed conflict. Stop. Okay. Um, when you don't hit home runs, the conflicts are prolonged. Let me just say, look, I don't think we can end this. Pro you know, Americans are always thinking about solving things, and I think we have to recognize there are some problems we cannot solve. We can only manage. So the gray zone approach allows us to better manage this problem. And I agree with you. We're, it doesn't allow us to solve it, but that's why you have to act on several parallel tracks to try to you know, bring uh, about uh, or try to catalyze the contradictions in the system over the long term. Although Iranian politics has its own internal logic that will by and large determine the outcome of developments there. And we can only shape that from the outside on a limited basis. So you have to recognize that you're not solving this problem. You're managing it better in a way that is less destabilizing and less disruptive to your interests. Okay. Um, about gray zone conflicts precluding effective net messaging. Let me just say, I don't think they're inconsistent because you could still be sending quiet messages confirming that you did cer certain things. Let me just say, I, I'm against a consistent approach. You need to take, you need to act in each moment in accordance with your interests in that moment. So sometimes, look, I've talked to the Israelis who say, with regard to their operations in Syria, they tell the Iranians, it is us. We're not saying it publicly, but it's us. And this is why we're doing it. And if you want us to stop, this is what you need to do. So there's nothing that prevents you from engaging in discreet, quiet messaging at the same time, okay? And also telling our allies, it's us that did this. We're not gonna say so publicly. And maybe it gets out in the media four months, six months later, but by then it's already passed. It doesn't matter, you're in a new, you're in a new place, okay? Um, I agree with, um, but but it doesn't preclude mess effective messaging. Okay, and sometimes it's better not to. It's better to keep the enemy guessing or the adversary guessing, because he will still say maybe it was them, and therefore I need we need to be more careful. Okay, and that you could use the ambiguity that Iran uses against us against them. Okay, um, I agree with the comment about proportionality in Iranian behavior. Okay, although I'm not sure it's inherently escalatory, um, I would argue that. Um, we have four decades of interacting with each other. We know each other reasonably well by now. Um, so uh, I, I think the fact that we've been dealing doing with this for four decades and we don't we haven't had a war indicates that it's not inherently escalatory. Okay. So I would I would just slightly disagree a little bit with that. Let me just say about deterrence. Deterrence has a limited shelf life, and the goal is not absolute success in deterrence. Absolute success is required in nuclear deterrence. Absolute su success is usually not attainable with regard to conventional deterrence, especially against a gray zone actor, because they will always find ways to act in which it's not convenient for you to respond. So the goal is not absolute deterrence, but to force the adversary to act in a way that is less destabilizing, using less desirable means from his perspective. Okay, and I think we've done a fairly good job in that, that we prevent the, prevented the Iranians from using their most potent tools in their toolkit. And as a result, they're forced to act in ways that are not as desired, you know, not as effective for them. And the bottom line is, we, they haven't caused us to change our fundamental policy with regard to maximum pressure, which I don't, you know, fully agree with anyhow, but that's another point. That's another issue. Um, so I would argue actually that um, we've, succeeded in forcing them to use less effective means, okay? 
the question about whether the ending U.S. influence um, uh, and, and, and their efforts to destroy Israel is, uh, or, or whether their goal of ending U.S. influence and, and destroying Israel is unrealistic, yes. But that doesn't mean they cannot have those aspirations, which I think they do. And look, from their point of view, they made the revolution against the most against the Shah who was supported by the great powers of the time, the US and, and, and Britain. So who knows what is possible from their point of view? These are these guys, the guys who are in the regime, not the, not the average Iranian who doesn't care about this. The guys in the regime are true, some of them are true believers, and they believe that this is not uh, beyond their reach, okay? Um, and let me just say, and I wanna wrap it up because I wanna get the other, other speakers a chance to respond. I um, my argument, you know, about if the U.S. withdraws, is, is the gray zone approach um, workable? My argument is because we are drawing down, we should use the gray zone approach because it requires less forces, because it depends on discrete, focused activity, not high intensity action, but, you know, once every six weeks, once every eight weeks, once every four months, you do something that's very focused, very limited, below the radar but gets the message across and forces the adversary to act more carefully, okay? Um, but let me just say, the, the gray zone approach is the dominant, I'm arguing for a gray zone approach, which is the dominant, but not the exclusive approach. Acting in the gray zone does not preclude you from acting overtly occasionally. And the best example of this is, we see how the Iranians responded to the killing of Qasem Soleimani. They came out of the gray zone and they launched missiles at El Assad Air Base in Iraq. You know, because they felt it was important, it was important, my take, it was important for them to be seen domestically as responding quickly to this blow to the regime so that the domestic population doesn't get any ideas that the regime is weak. So sometimes you come out of the gray zone when it's in your interest to do so and act overtly, and then you go back into the gray zone. And maybe the overt action strengthens your ability to act in the gray zone and strengthens deterrence vis-a-vis the adversary in the gray zone. I agree that Iran is opportunistic more than having a grand design. And I think they're motivated by both a combination of ambition and insecurity. They're not unique in this regard. Many countries are both insecure and ambitious. So humans are very complex and it's possible for humans to harbor apparently contradictory um, kind of attributes at the same time. In terms of deterrence by denial rather than deterrence by punishment, I will look at your study. I'm very interested in this and I'm willing to reconsider my approach. I just think vis-a-vis -vis Iran, working um, uh, trying to deter by denial gives makes makes your makes you know it imposes less risk on the adversary and and therefore enhances their ability to act. Okay, and therefore vis-a-vis -vis Iran, I think it's been a it's not been a winner. It's not been a winning approach for the U.S. But I'm willing to rethink this and I will review your own work on this and I look forward to that to reconsider my thoughts on this. And then finally, I just want to, how do you, and I'll, I'll let, wrap up on this because I don't want to go, I want to hear the other speakers. How do you change Iranian strengths into the vulnerabilities? For instance, if we were through the development of directed energy weapons to, to be able to neutralize Iran's missile force that they invested so much money in, okay, and they rely so heavily on, and, and their drone force. If we could develop, you know, air air defenses and missile defenses that are not just rely, reliant on kinetic means, but perhaps directed energy that was much more capable than what we have now, that would be doing that would be turning their strength into a vulnerability, or at least neutralizing the strength. Likewise, Iran's position in Syria means that they are now a status quo power in Syria. They have long lines of communication, which can be interdicted. So if we were inclined, which I don't see the Americans, you know, the American government being willing to do this now, but if we were inclined to support insurgent groups attacking the Iranians in Syria, their source of strength there would actually become a vulnerability because they would be focused on the security of their forces much more than they are now. Now they just have to worry about the Israelis. But if we were to, you know, support an insurgency there, which I don't, I don't see happening both because we've, we've abandoned the opposition in Syria for the most part, and we have no interest in this, but there are ways to turn this uh, strength uh, into a vulnerability. So um, I, I know I didn't answer all the questions, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to monopolize the, the the floor here, and I apologize for the, to those who uh, I didn't respond to. Um, but I'm glad to speak a little longer if you want at, at the end. But um, I, I want to give the others a chance to respond as well now. Thank you very much. Thank you again for uh, making those very very. Uh, illuminating remarks uh, that throws greater light on the kind of body of work that you're doing. 
I now invite Dr. Michael Connell uh, to uh, give us his uh, response to some of these questions that have been asked and and whatever our previous speakers have said. Go ahead, please. About three, three minutes, four minutes, please. Three to four minutes. Yeah, so very quickly. Um, Mike's the star of the show. I agree with practically everything he says, so I, not much to add. Um, uh, you know, I think I've heard a lot of comments about the suitability of, of gray zone competition for the relationship with Iran. I think the comments are actually spot on. I, I, the one thing I would raise is that I think some misunderstanding can accrue because we're assuming that if we're we're responding to Iran in the gray zone, that our response is going to mirror Iran's response. So when we're, when we're thinking about, there have been discussions about responding to Iran using gray zone tactics. That doesn't, it need not mean that the U.S. is conducting bombings and assassinations. It need not mean that we're employing proxies and all the, all the tools that Iran has at its disposal. The U.S. has different tools and we should think about gray zone a little bit more broadly. I mean, it, it, does, it need not be kinetic. It need not even be military. I mean, there are ways that we can compete economically. There are ways that we can compete using cyber, using information. I think we're- there Your was a, sanctions, a, your sanctions are uh, perhaps very effective too, right? Yeah, no, I think it is. I mean, it is, you know, I, it might not be the right move, but it certainly is a tool that I think is in the US toolbox and works very effectively. You know, whether it's the right tool to use at this time, I don't know, but it's it's um, it's it's something that plays to US strengths. And I think that's really what it's about. It's if, if the US is, the US needs to recognize, I think that it is in a long-term competition with Iran. I mean, the issue isn't gonna be solved. It's not about, you know, next month changing Iran's behavior it's not about overthrowing the regime on the other end of the spectrum. It's it's about recognizing there's a competition and managing that competition and using the tools that the U.S. has effectively. Um, there was a comment about, I won't, I, you know, I, there's not enough time to address all the same comments and Mike addressed most of them. But why, why, why would uh, restarting uh, negotiations, uh, uh, picking up the threads on the JCPOA not be part of the gray list? Oh, it is. And I didn't mean to say that it couldn't be. It certainly could be part of the of the grayness. Um, but I think we need to recognize that it's not going to be solved overnight. I don't think we're going to have a Nixon visiting China moment where suddenly, you know, relations are established and all of the the behaviors by Iran that, that the US finds objectionable are solved and, and all the behaviors that they find objectionable on our part are solved. It's 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 gonna be a slow process. And it and it need not preclude you know, engagement while at the same time competing. Um, and we certainly see that with with other other countries that the US has somewhat of an adversarial relationship with. Um, you know, whether it's Russia, China, you, you can engage, you can cooperate too, where there's areas where both sides have overlapping interests. It need not preclude cooperation. But I think the relationship certainly is defined largely by competition. Um, there was a question that was, you know, the Israel question. I think the Iranians are actually pretty realistic about what they can achieve vis-a-vis -vis Israel. There's a lot of ideological rhetoric directed against the Israelis, but I think in some ways the Iran's approach to Israel suits it domestically. Um, Iran almost needs an adversary like Israel and perhaps also the United States to hold up is kind of a, a prop in some ways ideologically for the regime. Um, and I, I think they they do manage that relationship as well. I mean, there's rhetoric about wiping Israel off the map or whatever, and I think that's largely rhetoric. It's competition again. Um, they, they, they certainly aren't about to embrace Israel. This competition has continued, but that relationship is managed somewhat. And finally, the, the point about Russia, I spend a lot of time in my current work looking at Russia, looking at Russia in the region, looking at Iran and Russia. I, you know, I get the sense that it's a growing relationship, um, but it's, they're not, they're more partners of interest than they are allies. Um, there's not a lot of love loss between those two regimes. I don't think that they fully trust each other. I think they have divergent interests in the region, whether it's Israel is a perfect example where Russia has a very positive relationship with Israel, Iran doesn't. 
Um, even in Syria, where the two have cooperated, I think there are divergent interests about the long-term objectives in Syria. So I, I, I think that relationship is, is not as strong as some would make it out to be. But I'll yield the ground because uh, there isn't a lot of time. Thank you very much. Uh, I now turn to General Major General B.K. Sharma. Your comments, please, about three to five, four minutes, three to four minutes. Uh, please, uh, yes, your mic is unmuted now. Please go ahead. No, please unmute your mic. It's already, now it's, yes, done. Perfect. No, it's locked again. You need to unmute it. I'll tell you when. Yes, spot on. Go ahead, please. So there was a question about, you know, whether Pakistan is following the same pattern in Afghanistan. I would say that uh, there are certain similarities and there are certain variations there. Uh, at the tactical level, yes, Pakistan is having a number of uh, proxies there, and sometimes it is playing one proxy against another within within Afghanistan. And there are other proxies like Sadiq, uh, uh, this is this uh, what is called Lashkar Taiba. You have uh, Lashkar Jangvi. You have Sipai Taiba, and even Islamic State of Khorasan Province, this ISKP. Many people say it is also a proxy of Pakistan. But only difference here is that while regime in Syria and uh, uh, Lebanon and uh, to an extent in Iraq are favorably inclined towards uh, uh, Iran, that is not the case in uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned. You know, the Afghan government of the day is not favorably inclined uh, towards Pakistan. Uh, with regard to other things, you know, there are certain contradictions which are coming in this gray zone conflict of United States of America. For example, there was a some kind of a resistance which was building up in Lebanon as also in Iraq against Iranians. There were demonstrations against Iranians there, you know, because there are certain leverages which they have been extracting there. But the moment you killed Soleimani and the other guy, Madhudi, you know, the people forgot everything and uh, actually it became a rallying point. And whatever ground you were gaining there to murky the waters and make sustainability of I I Iran difficult in those countries, uh, they were able to get a lease of life and they are again up and about in that in those countries again. The larger issue here, the two issues that I want to make, suppose uh, Trump had not gone on GCPOA, then would this the same gray zone strategy would be applicable in Iran, or would there would be more of a some kind of a rapprochement and some kind of a truce that would have taken place, and probably with the passage of time you would have moderated. It is very difficult tomorrow the new regime or the new government that comes in power in the United States of America. What is its take towards Iran and JCPOA? For all you know, it may try and revive the JCPOA and go for some kind of a rapprochement with, uh, with Iran. The last point is, you know, the post-COVID world is not going to be the same what pre-COVID world was. There's going to be a lot of uh, change that is coming, coming about, particularly rise of China and the way the competition is now, uh, you know, heating up in the Indo-Pacific between China, United States of America and other Will United States of America have the same bandwidth to engage or to have its Iranian obsession as it is now? These are some of the more points I would leave with you. Uh, thank you, General Sharma, for also pointing out that political changes in the United States could lead to uh, other changes in terms of approach to tactics in dealing with uh, Iran. Uh, I now turn to Commodore Abhay Kumar. Uh, Three to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just address one question uh, from our colleague Adil, uh, which has remained addressed and fundamentally relates to whether the Iran is winning the narrative war. Uh, now, uh, on this, uh, my own view is uh, actually it is mixed. Uh, while uh, Iran has uh, been attributed with uh, certain uh, very uh, negative uh, activities or approaches through the proxies uh, which has impacted its image 
particularly in west asia again uh, in the narrative war is more uh, dominated by the original fault lines so in that case it is not but in wider world uh, there is a some amount of a uh, growing uh, negative image of iran but simultaneously at the same time it is also developed a some kind of sympathy as a victim uh, uh, probably with the overarching approach we are going too high and fundamentally because of again related to unilateral approach of united states withdrawing from jcpoa while the wider other views were that probably it was working towards modifying behavior uh now us support to gulf monarchy and palestine issues working to uh, advantage to the iran within the re region within a narrow set of people yes but on a wider global front i think the it is more uh, mixed or it remains open uh, in so far as uh, next question is about the turkey outlook to iran and uh, russia i agree with the michael collin uh, fundamentally again uh, these uh, actors have their long term memories and uh, present alignments are based on a narrow interest base rather than the broader geopolitical shift and thank you very much uh, i will now invite dr meena singh roy to make her comments uh, kind of summary if you want to give us all 3 to 4 minutes we are obviously nearing the end of our webinar fascinating discussions i wish we could go on but uh, we had uh, allocated a certain amount of time for it and i know that all of you are uh, also occupied with other things dr meena singh roy uh, thank you sir i they don't think we need to to, to probably uh, get into summarizing the whole thing but one thing is very clear that you know uh, when we talk about iran you know there are no uh, clear conclusions coming out saying how do you deal with iran and what is deliverable in sense uh, that would uh, stop iran from behaving the way it has behaved and the reason for it i would say is because normally what is it that iran uh, aspires for uh, from from little interaction that i've had with them uh, first and the foremost is they want to be recognized as the regional power uh they want uh, to mend their fences with united states but on their own terms and conditions uh you know because they have felt that uh, they have been denied uh, the position which they deserve uh and uh, for that they have been fighting uh the third uh, point i think which comes out very clearly uh and i would say i completely agree with uh, with uh, michael uh, when uh, during his presentation when he said the, what he actually means by gray zone and uh, it is not uh, the uh, that is one option available to united states i i would say we really don't know how us uh, you know would uh, uh, plan its future strategy in the post covid uh, situation uh with iran but i don't see uh, the us iran uh, you know competition uh, or uh, you know their uh, tensions uh, going away in near future because the differences are such and the and uh, the behavior of of uh, you know the leadership uh, especially in both the countries uh, to an extent would also Uh, you know drive both the nation to uh, decide and work on the future policies and uh, more so in in case of of the united states uh, because the pentagon would probably have a different approach to deal with it than what the state department would say and what the the political leadership uh, would have uh, its opinion Uh, similarly the complex set uh, of the administration that you have within iran i think is too difficult uh, when we talk about the foreign policy approach who will call the shots will will it be the the foreign ministry or the irgc or or the certain uh, the the uh, hardcore uh, you know uh, clerics uh, which are very closely tied up with the supreme leader and uh, how the internal uh, situation in iran is going to unfold and i think that is where the key issue is 
the sanctions have really had an impact on Iran, but uh, to uh, as I see it, they haven't really changed the behavior and the nature of of uh, of Iran in many ways. Uh, will they come on the negotiating table? I I personally feel uh, it is it's a difficult, but uh, unless uh, they are cornered and there is a resistance from within. I don't think they would come to the uh, to the negotiating table. Uh, and to what kind of a, of, of partnership uh, uh, would help them uh, get a little more stronger? And this is where even if Russia is not a real partner, and there is, I don't think the Iranians trust Russians uh, to to uh, anymore. And they have said this uh, openly also. But despite the fact, you know, that this is the marriage of convenience for now, uh, we don't know how, uh, you know, things would unfold. But uh, one question which is, which I don't think we have addressed is uh, what would be Turkey's outlook to Iran's actions? Iran and Turkey, you know, their relationship has been uh, very, very uh, uh, unique. I mean, I would say when we look at, there have been partnership between both of them. But at the same time, they are also uh, competing. So in the long term, I, I think, uh, you know, Iran's partnership within Turkey and Russia would depend on a lot of factors uh, that uh, would uh, impinge on, on the future course of relationship that these uh, countries would have. But for now, uh, Turkey and Russia both would continue to engage Iran. Uh, I think I would stop here, uh, sir. And Thank I you. Thank you, Dr. Meena Singh Roy. Look, you know, this was uh, originally a lecture, as we all know, uh, by Mr. Michael Eisenstadt. And I'd hate to uh, wind up this webinar before giving him the absolute last word, uh, a minute, uh, just to, you know, come in and uh, just tear down anything that anybody else has said. Uh, so the floor is yours. And I will obviously stop after that. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be very quick. I, and I just want to use this time to try to answer some of the questions that I didn't answer, okay? Uh, but I don't really have any big, you know, I, I said more or less the main things I need to say. Um, you know, we were asked about um, particular examples of Iran's gray zone actions. And I'll give you, you look back last May where they um, conducted limpet mine attacks on uh, tankers in the Gulf. First four of them that were anchor, two that were uh, underway, and then the diversion of tankers the attacks on um, Saudi oil infrastructure, all of these non-lethal attacks, um, none of them that they, um, except for the diversions um, that they acknowledged. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a good example of how they operate in non-lethal ways to create a cycle, a disproportionate psychological effect. Of course, it didn't work because the United States hasn't changed its policy. With regard to Israel, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I take Iran's uh, approach uh, seriously that they would like to destroy Israel, but the, the Supreme Leader said this is a 25 year goal, okay, which means it's something someday, it's an aspirational goal. Um, but, and, but I think there's something uh, deeply psychologically unsettling for ideolo you know, for the, for the true believers in the regime, which are still a very small number within the entire society. Most Iranians don't care. They sympathize with the Palestinians on the basis of Islamic solidarity, but they don't really care. Um, they want they they have problems at home that they need to address, like the Gulf Arabs, you know. So, um, but I, I do I think look you cannot um, understand their uh, uh, investment of so many resources over the years in the Palestinian groups and Hezbollah, except from that framework of, you know, this kind of fixation on Israel. And the last point I'll make here um, is just about the, um, their, whether their psychological warfare has paid off for them. I, I would argue that um, the sectarian divide in the Arab world has become so dominant in recent years, although it's kind of easy now, but it was very hard for Arabs to see Iran through anything but this, um, sectarian divide after about 2011. Okay. And as a result, Iran, well, why, let me interrupt you here. Why did you say it's easy? Please clarify that. Point. I, I, I just, I have a sense that the sectarian conflicts um, in the region are not as strong today as they were just a few years ago. I, it's, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I don't think it's the dominant, look, you have a new act, you have different axes in the region. Okay. So you have the Persian Arab split, 
You have also the sectarian split. You also now have among the Sunnis, you have a split between the Turk, the Turkish, you know, Qatari, um, uh, Ikhwan axis versus those who are against that axis. So it's just much more complex. You have a much more complex regional alignment today. It's not just sectarian. So it's 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 less prominent than it was just a few years ago. But I would argue that Iran's stature in the Arab world, which was very high after 2006, because Ahmadinejad was seen as sticking his thumb in the U.S. all the time, in the, in the eye of the U.S. all the time, he was, he was popular. Nasrallah was very popular after 2006. No more. And right. And, and as a result, Iran is the boogeyman in much of the Arab world. And as a result, um, also because of the repression in Iran. You know, to the degree that regime governance after the Arab Spring was uh, became a major issue and how regimes treat their people was a major issue. Iran is seen as just part of the problem, the way they treat their people, like like all the, the regimes in the Arab world. So I, I think it's their 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 stature has gone down dramatically in, in recent years. Um, and, and they put tremendous emphasis on psychological warfare and information operations, because for them, this is very important. Because it's a different view of the relative weight of the different elements of national power, and this is where they have failed. Also, because of their attempt to dominate, you know, in Iraq, in Syria, and they're bragging about and Yemen and Lebanon, and they brag about it. And and Arabs, like most people, are very territorial. You keep you keep in your place. We'll keep in our place. But but Iran is meddling in in their in their in their place. So anyhow, I. I hope that uh, you know I addresses some of the questions that were asked uh, that I, didn't, I was not able to respond to before. Indeed, indeed, uh, you have actually walked us through a very, very complex terrain. Uh, you have actually unpacked for us the many folds of what is otherwise a very complex situation, uh, and also introduced this very uh, fascinating concept uh, of uh, a gray zone and uh, asymmetric ways of warfare and how to uh, yet the while try and bring about desirable outcomes uh, at minimum cost uh, in terms of uh, either blood or treasure. I mean, that's the ultimate objective uh, in, in any such contradictory situation. So let us hope that uh, uh, we can continue to engage uh, uh, one another. And I take this opportunity 15 minutes past our uh, <laughs> earlier determined time for ending the conference, but that only shows that there was greater interest uh, than than you would have imagined. Uh, people here are really, really keen to know more about your work and your views. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you in particular, Mr. Michael Eisenstadt, for joining us today, giving us uh, a, a very nice talk. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Michael Collin, Connell, uh, beg your pardon, uh, Major General uh, B.K. Sharma, Commodore Abhay Kumar, and uh, not the least, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, who's put in a lot of effort to, to arrange this webinar, Dr. Meena Singh Roy. And with these words, I wish you a very good evening from New Delhi. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you all, and please, everybody, stay healthy. But th thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All the best. Thank you.